It's Armie Katane, executive producer of the HBO documentary Tiger. He co-wrote the book Tiger Woods. Um, we had him on to talk about that book previously. Good morning, Armin. Good morning, fellas. How are you? Hey, going well. back to your book, um, I just reread a description of your preparation kind of to, to write the book, and it's pretty amazing. You read like 20 Tiger Woods books before you wrote your own version? We did. And, um, you know, we thought in the beginning that, you know, there was really no reason to write another Tiger Woods book because there were so many out there. But, you know, the more we read, the more we realized that, um, you know, everything from what Earl had written to some of the really top golf writers, um, what they had written, uh, guys like John Strage and, and, and Tim Rossiford, people like that, they were all set in certain periods of time of Tiger's life, whether it was right after he turned pro or during the 2000 run or during that period of time, um, right after the crash, and that there had never been this, you know, comprehensive 360-degree view of his life going all the way back into Earl's life and Tita's life. So, yeah, it was, um, you know, that and I think I looked at 350 different press conferences that he had held over the years, the transcripts from all of those, and we kind of color-coded them and broke them down by subject. And so, you know, we laughed in the end. Simon & Schuster paid us, a, you know, a pretty penny to do the book, but I, both Jeff and I felt like we were working for minimum wage by the time, hmm. you know, everything was all said and done. But that's what you have to do. You you really can't, um, you know, you got to put in the time. you got to, you got to, you know, put the shovel in the ground in order to, to write something that, that you feel holds up over time, which I think this book definitely will. Well, you did a great job with it. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I consider myself a tiger aficionado. A lot of us do, right? Millions of us do. Cause we've watched him since he was 16, 17 years old. And we've heard about him since he was winning junior amateurs. But uh, what I'm amazed at, like we've all seen a million times, the Mike Douglas footage, you know, at pumpkin Ridge, the fist pumps, all that stuff. But you had footage that I hadn't seen before. And that's what I found riveting. Like, just footage of him. Like, maybe, I don't know, a local news station maybe did a story on him or something. Oh, or, yeah. You know, at the house, um, you know, with Earl swinging. Um, you know, I was fascinated by just watching Earl. I always wonder, what kind of player is Earl that he raised this kid? Um, yeah. And then just... Earl just, was a just, good player. He was like a, you know, if not scratch, close to it. Wasn't yeah, Earl, he must have been. Wasn't Earl a great baseball player? Uh, yeah, he was. He started at... Uh, he broke the color line in I think which was then the big eight um, mm -hmm. was the first black to uh, play baseball when he was at Kansas state. Now Earl being Earl will tell you that he broke the color line oh. as a black athlete uh, with all the sports, but he was <laughs> definitely in baseball and he was a starting catcher and he also pitched and um, you know, he was a prominent member of the can it wasn't a great kansas state team but he he started and he was a very good baseball player yeah, yeah. i believe it but where did you so so my question is um you know a lot of the stories i'd heard i heard about the girlfriend and the letter and all that but you actually had footage you know i assume yeah. you got some of the footage from the girlfriend when like in high school which is amazing jason you got to see it it's yeah. tiger like dancing around in a house party you hmm. know in high school just being goofy um, and then the, the, the footage you got, like, from him playing golf with Earl when he was 13, 14. Where'd you get that stuff? Well, I would like to take credit for it, but I'm not going to. It's, it's really uh, the team of people that Alex Gibney, the Oscar-winning director, who, uh, documentarian, who obtained the rights to the book, he brought in just this all-star team of uh, producers and these archivists, as they're called. They, they dig up this material, and honestly... When I saw the first cut, kind of a, a rough cut of, of what Will Matt, you know, is now airing on HBO, I called ha Matt Hamachek, who's one of the directors who really was my closest contact, you know, with the film. And I, I was like, where in the world yeah. did you get that footage? Um, I, I had the same reaction. First of all, you know, when you were talking about the dancing yeah. and Tiger on his back playing the air sax, all of that. But then even some of the shots of Tita where you see her in front of the house looking kind of forlorn with the dogs. And yeah. It just plays kind of perfectly into the mood that that the two maths, as we were calling them, the two directors, Heinemann and, and Hamachek. And then um, 
you know, when Joe Groman, who was the assistant pro at the time, is talking about Earl's um, picadillos and infidelities, and he's talking about the Winnebago. And oh, that yeah, you had that in the scene, background. Oh. I was like, I can't believe this. So um, in part two, you're going to see some more footage that has never been seen before, um, particularly when Tiger got the bug about training with the Navy SEALs, um, that fantastic Wright Thompson story that was in ESPN, the magazine. Um, again, so much of these docs to make them what they are, to, to rise to the level that I think that Tiger does um, in both parts is, has to do with archival. Um, you saw it with the last dance and that was much easier because that was NBA entertainment and they had that in the vault and it was really, uh, Michael's decision to, as to when to release it under what circumstances. This was a, a, a monumental effort by Jigsaw and Jenna Millman who was one of the producers and several other people that were involved. Um, and I just kind of, we, we pointed them in a few directions, Jeff and I as, as consultants and, and ETs, mm -hmm. but they, it was their work that did it, and I was astonished um, when I saw it. Well, how did, how did it work? Because obviously Tiger's notoriously private. He didn't want to work with you on this. He didn't want to work with anybody on anything, really, right? He wants to do his own thing. Right. Um, and then I assume, we know how his relationship, like once you cross Tiger, you're out. Hank Haney, out. Barkley, out. Jordan, out, right? All these guys, out. I assume... Yeah. Everybody that participated in this has already been out. In fact, that Joe Groman, I think that's the assistant pro or whatever that you yeah. were talking about, he even mentioned it. He says, oh, my God, Tiger's going to hate this. I mean, you know, uh, I assume he was already yeah. out. Um, who, I assume everybody turned you down that still has a relationship with him. Um, I would say that's an accurate statement because yeah. they're really, when you look at it now, there are not that many people um, that are really close to that inner circle, um, of Tiger Woods. And you're never going to crack, you know, it's Mark Steinberg. It's, there's a few other people that are in that inner, inner circle and have been for years. It, it's, a it, you know, it's a waste of time to try to even get engage them to, to do anything. And understandably, as you said, Tiger controls his image. He controls everything that um, has his name on it. Um, but, what we, what Jeff and I were really successful doing is, and it took three years to do it, was to a obviously do our research, but b b then find people that had crossed paths with Tiger during certain periods of their life that hadn't really been talked to before, hadn't been um, <clears throat> discovered really, and that only comes from the from the reporting. But you're right. I can tell you that you know Marco Mira, who I have a good relationship with, right? When Tiger hit that fire hired in 09. Yeah. I mean, he and Mark didn't talk for, I would say months going on years. And I wow. think they've now repaired uh, a certain aspect of that damage. But Amber Loria, who is Mark and his former wife, Alicia's niece, she was really close to tiger. He wouldn't pick up the phone. And when she called, uh, I mean, there is a long list uh, is that the woman that you that, interview that's interviewed on the show? Who's the woman that's yeah, not the high school girlfriend? That's Amber Loria. Yeah, that's okay. the one. And she, she shows up again in part two. And it's, you know, it, it's pretty, um, uh, it, it's very emotional, I think, for her when she gets cut out. I mean, Stevie Williams is another one. I yeah. mean, you, you know, when you're in that circle, you're in. But when you're excommunicated from the House of Woods, you're out. Um, you're out. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And the Marco Mira, remind me again, was that because Marco Mira was critical of Tiger after it happened? Uh, no, what happened was, honestly, is is when Tiger hit the fire hydrant, I mean, he shut off communication with everybody. Barkley oh, okay. tried to call him. He wouldn't call him back. But there was a particular moment when Mark was being introduced, inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame at St. Andrews in Scotland, and the British Open was there. They were playing the Open at that time, and there were, I think, 21 Hall of Famers who went to the induction ceremony Tiger was playing in the open and chose, even after Mark specifically asked him to attend, did not attend Mark's induction. And uh -huh. that was, that was a, uh, a breaking point in their relationship. And it, it took a long, long time. I mean, Mark said to me when I interviewed him, 
sooner or later you've got to be human. And that real the tone of his voice, and it's in the book that scene, but the tone of his voice was just heartbreaking to me because. Mark was the older brother that Tiger never had, and Alicia O'Meara, when they were married, was the second mother that Tiger never had. Mm. Joined by Armin Gattay, and he's one of the executive producers of Tiger on HBO and HBO Max January 10th and 17th. How great has it been working with HBO with the push they're putting behind it? I saw you retweet George Lopez. I'm assuming this is out in L.A., where it looks like a 20-story building, the entire side of it has you know a picture of tiger and the fact that it's it's airing on hbo that that has to be great to have that marketing push behind it too no question it's we've had a bunch of meetings that i've just kept my mouth shut pretty much and just listened but when you get behind you know i worked for real sports for 10 years and i they know how to promote things but when you walk into this new warner media at&t um and particularly because it was at the end of the year and they had they had money to spend out of that 2020 budget into 2021. Uh, when we heard what they were going to do across not just social media, but the PR push has been amazing. But when I saw those billboards for the first time, I called Bentley Weiner, who's one of the top producers at HBO, and she's head of their docs unit. And we've known each other way back to our days at, at HBO together. And I went, oh, my God, they're just they're not fooling around here. And Honestly, I, I, I know it's because how, how much they love the doc. They wouldn't be doing this if they thought it was a run of the mill, um, you know, ordinary piece of filmmaking. And when everybody has seen it internally, and I know I'm speaking as an executive producer, but the nuance and how personal it is and how intimate it is. And I think ultimately the father son story and how humanizing it is in many ways for tiger um, just caught everybody's um, attention, and yeah, they've done an enormous job, um, and they're still working on it. There, there's still requests coming in, uh, so I'm just um, uh, I'm really grateful that that we have something like a powerhouse that has really AT and T is behind it too, because I know I've been told that the the people at the highest levels of AT and T have watched the doc and love it. So that, that there's a complete corporate push going on here. Would would I assume there's no chance Elon would talk to you? Well, we reached out to Elon for the book, and um, you're going to see the woman uh, Sandra who wrote the People magazine cover story. The only time Elon ever talked about what happened with the marriage, and she's in this in part two. We reached out to Elon, um, and we were able to make a very good connection with Elon's attorney who was responsible for, um, and it was almost like a a corporation breaking up in the divorce uh, when you're talking about literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And so through her attorney, um, we were able to communicate with him and he was communicating um, with Elon. And so we felt like when we, when we were writing, we were writing um, with her in mind and, and, and so Jeff, that was Jeff Benedict, my co-author. Um, you know, we were very conscious of trying to get as close to Elon as possible. She declined to, to do a personal interview with us, which is completely understandable. But we really felt like we captured the moments and captured her feelings. And I think the doc does the same thing through, through Sandra's eyes, who has become a good friend of Elon since she wrote that cover story. Armin, isn't it uh, just amazing how much how similar the body, uh, you know, language and mannerisms are of, of Tiger's son. Oh, like yeah. Ch- Charlie. Yeah, it really is. I mean, he looks I, just like him. It's incredible. I know. And all that, I mean, it, you know, so you can see stuff on social media where, you know, this is, it's almost like you see a little mini movie where, you know, Charlie's touching his face and Tiger's touching his face and Charlie's doing this and Tiger's doing that. I was, you know, I got to tell you guys, I was, because I've been so close to this the last five years, I was really unsettled about the idea of Charlie participating in the PNC and the whole father son thing. I just kept going back to, you know, thinking about what happened with Tiger and Earl and the, you know, the benefits, but also the, uh, you know, the, the cost, you know, they, they, in many ways, the terrible cost of his childhood. But I, I got to tell you, I think Tiger handled it 
as well as you possibly can, keeping Charlie oh, yeah. out of the limelight. You can see that Charlie wasn't overwhelmed. I, I don't know where this goes from here because, you know, God knows I, I do know what it was like for Tiger to be 11. And, um, and I don't know what it would be like for Charlie now to go to, what is it now? It would be middle school. And, um, and, and, you know, now you're Charlie Woods. Yes, you were Charlie Woods before, but now you're Charlie Woods. It's been on national television at 11 mm-hmm. years old. So mm-hmm. um, I think if anybody understands how to handle that pressure and how to do things differently, it's Tiger. So, um, you know, I've stopped playing amateur psychologist with him. I took, I took the shingle off the, off the wall and um, I just enjoyed it. It was just really nice to see that father son moment with him. Do you think, uh, last question, is, speaking of that, I hate to ask you this, but do you think that Tiger has changed? Do you think he's a better person now than he was then? Well, there's a word that we that we tossed around a lot, and, and it's not, you won't see anybody say it in the doc, and, and we kind of, you know, steered clear of it in the in the book, and that's redemption. You, you can certainly talk about the rise and the fall and the return. But when you start talking about redemption, you're talking about an entirely different kind of a dynamic. Do I think personally? Yes, I do. I saw him in San Diego in the January, late January of 18, um, at Torrey Pines at the farmers. And that was the end of the book. And I saw a different tiger there in the wake of what we all witnessed on Memorial day weekend, 2017, um, on the side of the road in Florida, thinking he was in California. Um, and I saw more engaging, a more um, accommodating, and yes, the word was human, a much more human Tiger Woods. And I, I mean, then you watch what happened at the Masters, and I don't think that you can look at that and not feel like that's a different Tiger Woods. So, man, the guy's lived, he's 45 years old, he's lived about three lifetimes already. So I hope this next 45 years of his is something that we can all look back on at some point in time and say, man, this guy really enjoyed, you know, being a father, being a husband, being a dad, being, being tiger, um, like we've never seen him before. And, but I do believe, and maybe I'm being a little Pollyannish here, which is not my normally my cup of tea, but, uh, (laughs) Um, I do believe he's a uh, he's a more he's more human than he's ever been before. Yeah. Marmon, part two comes out this weekend. The doc is Tiger, the executive producer. Of course, he co-wrote the book Tiger Woods. Thanks a lot for joining us. We loved having you on. Oh, fellas, thank you. I enjoyed yep. it. Yeah, thank, thank you, thanks, buddy. Marmon.